All right, it's 12.01, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the 2021 virtual series, Forum on Aging in Rural Oregon. Rather than our traditional in-person event this year, the Oregon Office of Rural Health is hosting a series of virtual forum sessions the third Thursday of each month from 2 to 3 p.m. And we do plan on being back in person in Seaside in 2022. So we'll get to see everybody face to face uh, soon, I hope. Uh, so I wanna thank you all for joining us today and thank, um, thank you to our partners, Central Oregon Health Council, the Older Adult Behavioral Health Initiative and GOBI for helping make this series possible. Next slide. I do wanna show that our speaker has no conflicts to disclose in giving this presentation. Next slide. And before we get started, I'll orient you to this virtual platform. The audio has been muted and the video is turned off for all attendees. Select the ellipsis to populate the chat and question and answer features to your right. We ask that you please ask questions using the question and answer feature and use the chat function for everything else, including any technical difficulties you might experience. The presentation slides and recordings will be posted shortly after the session on the Office of Rural Health website at the link on the slide. And if you'd like to see EU for the session, please complete the survey at the end of the session. I'll post a link of the to the survey toward the end of the session, and you will be able to receive, and you will also receive an email from Sarah Anderson about a week after this event, which will include a link to access the slides and recording, as well as an, a session evaluation link. With that, I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, Britta Wilson. Britta is employed by Providence Health and Services and is the program coordinator for volunteers in action in Hood River. In addition to her work with Providence, she serves on the Governor's Commission on Senior Services and on the Steering Committee for the Aging and the Gorge Alliance. She received her BA in Human Studies from Merrill Hurst University and an MA in Gerontology from Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, BC. Britta has over 20 years of experience working with older adults and people with disabilities and is passionate about intergenerational relationships and programs and serves that services that help people age in place in their communities. Britta, I turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction. Um, as Robert said, my name is Britta Wilson. I'm a gerontologist. I work for Providence Hood River Memorial Hospital as the program coordinator for volunteers in action. I use she, her pronouns. Um, just to kind of provide some context to my environment today, I am um, presenting from my home. I have two small dogs. They're generally pretty quiet and well behaved. Unless I randomly get a delivery, then I will have to like pause and mute myself. Um, to get a little intro to see who's here today, I would love for you to put in the chat maybe where you're located as well as what brought you here today, like why you're interested in learning about volunteers in action. Are you a volunteer? Are you a program coordinator? Are you interested in starting up a program like this? Do you see a need for this in your community? Just to kind of provide some context of who's here today. I see we have a nurse from Central Oregon. Ooh, lots of people here. Someone from Age Friendly Sisters, awesome. We've got our older adult behavioral health specialist. Awesome. Well, cool, cool. Well, welcome everyone. And thanks for kind of uh, letting me know sort of who's here in this space with us today. Um, there's a tradition at Providence that we start off all of our meetings and events uh, with what we call a reflection. And so um, in keeping with tradition, I'm going to offer a reflection to everyone today. This is um, from the book, The Art of Forgiveness by Jack Cornfield. Love does not grandstand. Like water, it is humble and unstoppable. Love does not try to fix the whole world. It is enough to plant seeds of kindness and justice everywhere we can. Mother Teresa wrote, I never look at the masses as my responsibility. I look at the individual. I can only love one person at a time. I can only feed one person at a time. Just one, just one. 
So you begin, I begin. The whole work is only a drop in the ocean. But if I didn't put that drop in, the ocean would be one drop less. Same thing for you, same thing in your family, same thing in the community where you live. Just begin, one, one, one. So um, today I'm gonna kind of provide a little bit of background and the mission of Volunteers in Action. And then I'll also kind of talk about some more nuts and bolts of the program, like what our volunteers do, what are the eligibility requirements for participation. I definitely want to um, speak specifically about the different opportunities um, we have to engage younger people in this work. And then of course, we'll also have to talk about um, COVID-19 and its impact on the program. My real hope today is to inspire you to either seek out a similar program where you live um, and figure out ways that you can support and participate in those programs. And if there currently does not exist something like this where you are to maybe inspire you to try to get something started. This is the mission of Providence. Um, I'm sharing this because Volunteers in Action is supported by Providence through our community benefit requirement as well as the Providence Foundation. The idea of volunteer caregiving was established in 1984 with initial funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. They called it Faith in Action. And it started out with about 25 different pilot programs. In the following years, uh, it grew to over a thousand programs across the United States. And that included um, our program out of the Hood River Hospital. And ours started in 2004 and it was um, with the grant funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation of about $35,000 we were awarded to start up this program. Volunteers were initially recruited primarily through faith communities. And the initial mission was really focused on um, helping people maintain their independence. Over the years, like while um, helping people to maintain independence is still a really important piece of the program, our focus has kind of shifted to the importance of relationship as well as providing practical help. Program is now about 15 years old. Um, I've been with it for about four years. And the funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation clearly has long since expired and Providence has assumed 100% of the cost. The mission of Volunteers in Action is to support people in maintaining independence through compassionate relationships. Through our work, we know people care for them and ease their way. Our goal is to provide both social and practical support. And this piece is really important to empower care receivers to pursue wellness on their own terms. So our volunteers are not there to try to force their ideas of health and well being on people or to try to coerce people into making particularly healthy decisions. We're really there to support the care receiver in defining whatever health and well being is to them. And the people who receive our services are typically adults who are living with some kind of chronic health condition or a short term medical vulnerability, like a hip replacement. So anyone that's over the age of 60 is potentially eligible for our services. Um, but we also do serve people under the age of 60 as long as um, they are over the age of 18 and they have some kind of chronic illness or disability. We require that they reside in either a private home or apartment. They can live in a long term care facility, but the services that we provide um, to those individuals is limited. We usually just provide companionship to those people because the idea is if they're in a facility, most of their needs should be uh, provided by the facility. People may or may not be disabled, but they have to be mobile enough to safely get in and out of a volunteer passenger vehicle on their own. The idea is that our clients have the ability to live independently with just some friendly neighborly help from time to time. So we can't have somebody that's completely dependent on this program or on a volunteer for them to remain safely in their homes. They can be any income level, they can be any faith, and all of our services are completely free. And we serve the county of Hood River, and then we also serve our neighbors over the river into Washington and the town of White Salmon. The average age of our care receiver is about 74 years old. Our oldest care receiver currently is 100 years old. 
a little over half of those people live completely alone. And even though we don't have an income requirement, it's something that we still track. And you can see about two thirds of our clients are at or below 200% of the federal poverty line. The role of our volunteers, I always say that they're just like a chain in the link of support for people. So we're there to support um, family, friends, neighbors, and continuing to care for a relative. We're a new friend to share both the joys and sorrows of life with. Our goal really is to keep people as independent as possible for as long as possible in the community. And then our volunteers are really the eyes and the ears of the community on some of the most isolated people. So we have some clients where their volunteer might be the only person that they see in a month, two months, three months. And so the volunteers are really able to see changes in that person's condition over time refer them to resources as needed. Um, and then we also can prevent crisis through this ongoing support. Here is a list of our core services that we provide. I'd say the number one request that we get is for transportation. We do a lot of rides for people. So transportation is our biggest service. And then second to that is probably companionship. And I'm seeing that more and more and as time goes on that we get referrals for people who are just lonely and um, they need a volunteer just to provide some companionship. In addition to these individual services, we also offer evidence-based health promotion classes to the wider community, like powerful tools for caregivers or WISE. We also annually have this event called Good Neighbor Saturday. So once a year, uh, we have a huge number of volunteers. We usually have over 100 volunteers that are divided into teams and go out and provide a day of service. So we typically meet in the morning. We provide breakfast for the volunteers. They receive their assignments, and then out they go. And it's usually done by noon. This is a great opportunity for people who maybe don't have the time or capacity to do ongoing volunteer work throughout the year. We also have a lot of local businesses that participate in this as a way to give back to the community. Um, I do want to take a moment to talk about the importance of intergenerational relationships. I'm gonna kind of like take off my volunteer coordinator hat and put on a more critical gerontologist hat. Um, I really do view aging as both a personal and political process. And recently there's been a lot of attention on racism and sexism, which is good. And there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in those areas. Um, but I noticed that there's far less attention paid to ageism. And I hope that in time, that's something that's considered more, especially if you think about the intersectionality of oppressed identities and the way that age plays into that. Um, we know that ageism is similar to racism and sexism. They're all based on these assumptions that then direct some kind of prejudice or discrimination towards a group of undeserving people. Yet the biggest difference between something like sexism or racism and ageism is that um, hopefully we will all become old. So um, even though we will one day be part of that group, we continue to attach these stereotypical views to a widely diverse group of people based solely on their age. And I think that this is true not only of older people, but we do this to younger people too. And I spend a lot of time thinking about how to combat ageism. And I really do believe that exposure to various age groups throughout the life course is one way to do that. So I think particularly for younger people, it's really important that we provide opportunities for them to engage with older people, especially older people that are maybe even just outside of their family groups. Um, I think of young people as just old people in training. So how is the best way to learn about something is to talk to somebody who's already done it. So my hope is that by engaging younger people in this work, um, we are setting them up for success for them to combat their own internalized ageist assumptions. So the different ways that we provide opportunities is that um, in Volunteers in Action, 
anyone of any age can volunteer. So there's no restriction on how old you have to be to participate. Um, if you're under 18, you can volunteer as long as there is an adult approved trained volunteer with you. We call them team leaders. And we partner with a variety of different groups in the community. Um, Young Life helps us out a lot. They're a Christian youth group. We work with the National Honor Society at Horizon Christian School. And I would say that probably our biggest partner is the Hood River Valley High School. There's various different clubs um, and classes that engage with our programs. Um, I was actually just talking to the teacher that teaches the health career technical education classes at the high school earlier this week. And I was really excited to hear that they have 70 high school students that are enrolled in these classes and are ready and willing to volunteer with us in this next school year. That's a lot of kids. That's a lot of kids. So I'm trying to think of different ways to put them um, with the program. In addition to just our regular volunteer services, we're talking about having high school students collect the oral histories of older adults and then partnering with our local history museum to somehow display those oral histories. And I'm really excited about that work. We'll see, we'll see where it goes. I did wanna share a couple of quotes directly from our clients about the impact that the program has. So one client says, my house is safer, cleaner, and more comfortable thanks to VIA. This program keeps me in my apartment. I'd have to leave if you didn't come help me keep things clean. And I love talking with my caregiver. She helps me feel connected to what's going on in Hood River. Another client says, Volunteers in Action program has helped me in numerous ways. They are a bridge and needed transportation, particularly with medical appointments outside of Hood River proper. BIA also has helped and supported me with various disability resources processes. In short, Volunteers in Action puts the forward motion on things I cannot accomplish on my own, and they do it with grace and kindness. Obviously, like everything in the whole world, our program was uh, severely impacted uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic, and we are currently still operating underneath these restrictions. We have yet to resume to full services. Uh, when the governor shut down the state, we immediately had to stop all in-person volunteer activities. So we really had to pivot and become creative and think about what is, what is it that we can do to continue to support our clients even if we can't be physically present with them. So all of our companionship matches um, converted to just being able to visit over the phone, which admittedly has its own issues. Not everyone can hear very well over the phone. Um, we also started a pen pal program for the residents of Down Manor, which is an independent senior living community in Hood River. And we also collected notes, postcards, pictures, words of encouragement, you can kind of see in the upper right hand picture. Um, we collected these and they were distributed to Meals on Wheels clients. We provided music for the residents at Brookside Manor, which is a memory care facility. Uh, you can see one of our volunteers there playing guitar. So the residents would open their windows and our volunteers would go around and play music and sing outside their windows. Even though volunteers were no longer able to provide in person services as an employee of Providence, um, I was still able to access that. So I have been providing um, all of the transportation for our clients for the last year and a half. Um, I've had to reduce what that transportation is for. Historically, we provide transportation to people wherever they need to go, um, but that's now been reduced to just medically necessary appointments. And we're also applying for a grant through Pacific Power to get an electric vehicle to reduce the cost and the strain to the environment for providing all this transportation. We started offering no contact grocery shopping and delivery. So we partnered with a local nonprofit, nonprofit called The Next Door. And they were able to open store accounts at a couple of different grocery stores for us. In the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lot of fear and we did not know how transmissible the disease was even through just surface contact. So we wanted to limit uh, volunteers like exchanging money with clients. 
So they would get the grocery list from the client over the phone, go to the store, and when they went to go make the purchase, it would just get charged to the store account. And then the volunteers would drop off the groceries with an invoice that clients could then reimburse us through. So there was no exchange of money. Um, we pivoted all of our health promotion classes to being offered virtually. We've offered a powerful tools for caregivers and a wise class. And we also partnered with AARP's Senior Planet to teach technology to older adults. So we taught classes on how to use Zoom, um, how to do telehealth, how to shop online. We also offered a class on how to spot fake news on the internet. We offered online monthly death cafes, as well as a weekly, weekly listening hour through Zoom, and that was open and available to both volunteers and clients. And we've been able to continue to provide yard work for people. I wanted to share these numbers with you because I feel like this is a very interesting snapshot of what the programs look like. So you can see in 2019, that's a pretty typical year for us. We probably average like two to three client, new clients a month. That's pretty normal. And then even less than that for volunteers throughout a year. There's always kind of a peak for us in the spring, like March, April in new volunteer recruitment, largely because that's when we have our Good Neighbor Saturday event and there are some people who enjoy doing that work so much that they decide to sign on and be a long-term volunteer with us. In 2020, it's a very different picture. So far fewer clients um, that enrolled each month. I think that is due to the reduction in the type of services we could offer. And then if you look at our new volunteers, in March and April, we had about 24 new volunteers in just two months, which is way more than what we normally even have in a year. I think people were feeling really helpless and just trying to find ways to connect and feel like they were doing something in the face of the crisis. And we were really fortunate that we already had the structure of this program in place so we could easily plug people into a need. So getting a little bit more into the nuts and bolts of the program. Clients complete an application. They can either self refer into the program um, or we also get a lot of referrals from social workers, primarily sometimes from community health workers as well. And then when there's a request for services, I make a home visit. And really, I'm there to ensure uh, the safety of the environment, not only for the client, but especially for the volunteer too. I would never send a volunteer into an unsafe space. And then I'm also making sure that the scope of what this person needs fits within the context of the program. Like, is it reasonable to ask a volunteer to come and do this? If it's not, then I uh, refer them on to other services. In order to become a volunteer, they also complete an application. They have to go through a background check. They're trained, they receive a TB test, they get an official Providence badge. And then I also check their license and insurance if they're gonna be transporting people. We offer a few perks. I wish that we could offer more and I hope to in the future, but generally throughout the year, we offer a variety of social events. They get 10% off a local CSA and they also receive mileage reimbursement. This is the software system that we use. It's called Better Impact. We're fairly new to the software system. We implemented it like at the very end of 2019. And I'm really grateful that we did because it allowed us to very easily shift our program to becoming more virtual when the pandemic hit. So both volunteers and clients can complete applications online and their information is automatically uploaded into a profile for us. Volunteers can complete their training online. They can also log into a volunteer portal to see available opportunities and sign up for those opportunities. They can log into their own profile portal and see what upcoming assignments that they have. 
They can also see their own client's contact information, log hours, log mileage, access files like a volunteer training manual. And then the software program also allows me to pull reports. Some best practices for having a program like this um, is number one, to try not to pass judgment on people, um, really attempt to try to understand various family dynamics, to not judge a family situation or especially the care receiver. Um, this is something that I have to actively practice. Um, for example, I have clients who rely heavily on the program, even though they have multiple children that live locally. And so it would be very easy for me to become judgmental and wonder why are they relying on a volunteer when they have three kids that live nearby? Um, so I'm always trying to remind myself, like, I do not know the context of their relationship. I do not know their history. And maybe this person was a terrible parent to their kids, but it doesn't mean that they should be denied services. So just trying to keep an open mind and try not to judge people. Again, it's extremely important that we acknowledge the right for our care receivers to make their own decisions and to not enforce our own ideas or values onto them. Our volunteers really do need to be alert to any changes in a person's condition or any signs of abuse and to report that. Our volunteers are trained in uh, very specific needs for people. So how to communicate with someone that has um, a hearing issue or a vision issue, how to recognize strokes, how to communicate with someone that has dementia. We honor the infinite dignity of every human being and we use words with dignity. So we would never say a disabled person. We would say a person with a disability. We wouldn't say a demented person. We would say a person with dementia. And then the most important piece, well, maybe not the most important, but an important piece is to have fun and enjoy each other's company. So after a volunteer and a client meet for the first time, I always check in with both of them just to make sure that it's a good match. If for any reason at all, they don't even have to tell me the reason if they don't want to, but for any reason at all, it's not a good fit. It's totally okay. I just find them a different match. And sometimes they do have to go through multiple matches before they really find one that works for them. In our volunteer training, we do go through different safety practices. We talk about what happens if you have an appointment with someone and you show up at their house and they're not answering the door. We talk about what happens if somebody has a fall during a visit, how to recognize a stroke. And then now more important than ever is hand washing and disease prevention. And then our volunteer training also goes into some topics that I believe are a little unusual for a volunteer training, but I think are really important when you're doing this kind of work. So volunteers are also trained on grief and loss, loneliness and intimacy. They're taught skills for self-awareness and self-care. And we talk a lot about boundaries and consent. Boundaries are the glue that hold this whole program together. Um, they provide predictability, shared expectations for what's going to happen during a visit. They protect the privacy and autonomy of both the care receiver and the volunteer. And they're really what allow people to feel comfortable both receiving and giving assistance. So I'm always encouraging um, the volunteers to be very aware of like where their boundaries are, what they're comfortable doing. They're always encouraged to say no to any opportunity that I offer them or to say, I need to think about it. And same goes for the care receivers. Um, we are going to have to touch on loneliness and social isolation. Although if you're like me, you've probably attended 20 different webinars in the past year about this. So I'm just going to like briefly sort of touch on the differences between those two. So social isolation is an actual number of social contacts. It's something that's measurable and it's something that I can say like with confidence is addressed by this program. So just by enrolling into this program, we're automatically increasing the number of social contacts that somebody has. Loneliness on the other hand, um, even though it's receiving a lot of attention lately, especially with all of the negative health consequences attached to it, 
um, is something that's a little bit squishier, a little bit harder to get a hold on. And it's something that I could say is sometimes addressed by this program, but it's not a guarantee. Um, the loneliness aspect really depends on the quality of the relationship between a client and a volunteer. And it's not easily, um, it's not easy to replicate or predict. This is a quote by Richard Bach that I really love. The opposite of loneliness is not togetherness, it's intimacy. So throwing people or throwing volunteers at a lonely person is not necessarily going to make them less lonely. So intimacy is the closeness between people and it's something that occurs over time. Um, I like to think of it as coming from vulnerability that is then met with some kind of support and acceptance. And again, it's something that happens over a period of time to sort of gain that trust between two individuals. And it's a process, and I would never say it's the goal of a program or, a, or of a match even, and it's not like a destination that we're trying to get to. It's something that just is an ongoing practice. And it's something that a client and a volunteer may never achieve, and that's okay. I have some clients that I've known for a number of years who I would consider like we've achieved a certain level of intimacy together. Like I know that they share things with me that they don't share with anybody else. But then I have other clients that I've known for the same amount of time. It's very like task oriented. Like I show up, I do the tasks that they want me to do and I leave and the relationship doesn't go to a deeper level and that's also okay. Um, but I do wanna share a couple of examples of when the magic does sort of happen and intimacy does occur. Um, so I'm gonna read a couple of just short stories. So this first one is actually written by one of our volunteers and um, it's about a client who I'm going to call Hal. I've been visiting Hal at an assisted living facility for over a year. He had a stroke 20 years ago, and before this, he was a very active man. His wife, Judy, died unexpectedly three years ago. Just after Thanksgiving, Hal seemed a little down when I walked into his room. He said it's lonely living in the facility and physically he can't do much. I guess I was trying to cheer him up a little and pointed out the fact that he has a good sense of humor and a very sharp mind. He said that yes, he is good at math and a lot of other things, but he isn't so good with his emotions. I asked what he meant by that, and he said, I can't seem to control them very well, and that lately I feel like crying a lot. I told him there's nothing wrong with crying. He went on to tell me that when his son visited the other day, they looked at Hal and Judy's wedding album together, and it brought back so many good memories of happier times in his life. He misses her a lot and the good times they had together as a family. They were married 33 years. As he spoke about those years, tears came to his eyes. I asked if I could see the wedding album. As we looked through it together, Hal told me about each picture, who the people were and what was going on. We agreed that Judy was indeed a beautiful woman. He gave me little vignettes about their life together and several times tears came to his eyes. I said that 33 years of happiness with someone is a very special gift and not everyone gets to experience that in life and how lucky he and Judy were to have had that. He agreed and then asked me about losing my husband. My husband died 10 years ago from cancer at the age of 48. He said it must have been very hard for me also, and I agreed. It was a very special moment to share with Hal. We both knew and could share with each other how it feels to lose someone you love. And the next story that I want to share um, is actually taken from an article that was written about our program that was published in Rural Light Magazine um, about Dottie and Mary. At 93, Mary can barely see, hardly hear, and spends most of her time sleeping. But when Dottie starts to sing, Mary's face brightens and the two join together in song. For one hour each week, the ravages of age, blindness, deafness, and dementia are briefly lifted, and Mary is returned to her previous self. Music teacher at Parkdale Elementary School, director of the Sweet Adelines, choir director at St. Mary's Catholic Church, and a cultural leader of the community. Mary isn't Dottie's first match. 
She previously helped an elderly woman with household chores and visited with a gentleman and prepared his lunch. But Mary is closest to her heart. The two actually met back in 1981 when Mary was the director of the Sweet Adelines, now known as Harmony of the Gorge. Dottie is a member of that choir. The VIA match was completely unintentional and now bittersweet. In a way, it's sad to see her this way, Dottie says. I just love her. She's like a second mother to me. This program has been good for us, says Lindsay, Mary's granddaughter and full-time caregiver. Dottie's weekly visits allow Lindsay to take a short break from around the clock caregiving. She can dash to the post office, tend to the garden, or just enjoy a moment alone. It's nice to have a break for an hour, she says. We are very, very thankful for Dottie. A lifelong soprano, Mary now strains to hit the high notes, but that doesn't deter the duo. Sitting close and holding hands, Mary and Dottie reach into the recesses of the mind to share words that still ring true. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. So my, again, hope today is that by sharing these stories and sharing information about this program to inspire you to seek out a similar program in your community, figure out ways that you can support and participate in it. Um, and if there does not have one that exists to um, maybe consider forming one of your own. There are a few other programs similar uh, to Volunteers in Action that I'm aware of. I have two sister programs within Providence. One is in Newburgh, one is in Seaside. Age Plus has Circles of Care, which currently serves Wasco County, which neighbors Hood River County. Clackamas County's AAA recently started a program like this. And then I know of Age Friendly Sisters in Southern Oregon, they also have a volunteer program. I would recommend, if this is something you're interested in doing, to have all of your volunteers engage in some kind of training, pass a background check, do a TB blood screen. If starting a whole new volunteer program is a little overwhelming for you, you can always just do a single day volunteer event like our Good Neighbor Saturday. And to ask yourself, what are different ways that you can remove barriers to having people volunteer with your program? I get a lot of feedback from volunteers that a main reason why they enjoy volunteering with us is because it's so flexible. Like it's not a set day or set hour that they have to be there and volunteer. It's really flexible to meet the needs of their schedule. Um, and there's no minimum hours that they have to do to volunteer with us. So even if they can really only volunteer a few hours in a year, like we'll, we'll accept the help. Some resources, if this is something that you're interested in doing, there's the National Volunteer Caregiving Network. They were kind of born out of those original programs from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and they provide a variety of services to get you up and running. So they provide startup manuals, they provide volunteer training. They also have um, a software program called Ride Scheduler, which is what we used up until 2019, or when we moved over to Better Impact. It is membership based. There's an annual fee associated with joining that network. It's not very much. I think it's like $100 a year. Um, Senior Core is another program that has funding attached to it and it directly is connecting like older adults to other older adults. Our program uh, partners with JBC Northwest to do an AmeriCorps Jesuit volunteer program which is hugely beneficial to our program. We're really fortunate to have a Jesuit community in Hood River. Every year we apply and have a JV that provides 40 hours a week to our program of service. Um, there are Jesuit volunteer communities throughout the state. I think there's one in Bend, one in Gresham. There's probably one in Portland. So you could always contact JVC Northwest to see if there's one in your community. If not, you might want to talk to other nonprofits in your community and see if there's a way to start a Jesuit community. Um, and then also just look around your community and see what are other unique resources that you may already have that you can tap into and access. Um, I definitely want to share my contact information and then we can kind of get into some questions if anyone has any. Um, in all sincerity, please uh, feel free to reach out and contact me if this is work that you're interested in, in doing. I'm always happy to share 
knowledge, resources, anything I possibly can. I'm really passionate about this work and I would love to see this model grow and be present across the entire state of Oregon. So I'm sincere when I say like, don't hesitate to contact me. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, I think, and see if there's any potential questions that I can answer for you. Yeah. No, so I have can remind you. Really, really appreciate it. Um, and we'll open it up to question and answers. But right before we get there, I just have to say I really appreciate appreciate that intergenerational piece that you talked about and how important that is for both the older adults, but also the younger kids in a community to understand the value of the, of the older adults in our community. Yeah, absolutely. I started volunteering with older adults when I was 13 and it completely changed my life. So I'm always trying to encourage other young people to get involved. So there is a, um, I want to encourage people to put your questions in the Q and A. It's easier for us to, to monitor those versus the, the chat piece. But one person did ask about the presentation being shared and yes, it will be. Uh, it, we will be posting this up on our website um, later today. And then there will also be an email going out from Sarah uh, in a little over a week that'll have the, the, the link to the slides as well, so. There's one question that says, do you see better impact for volunteers in the client module? Um, yes, so better impact has, I use both a volunteer, like better impact automatically comes with like a volunteer management software that it's like its main piece. And then you can add on the client module. And so we use both to manage both volunteers and clients. I hope that answers the question. Great. And others, do you do outreach like set up at the fair to recruit volunteers as well as presentations like this? Uh, absolutely. So, I mean, we haven't done a presentation at a fair, but we do, or historically in the past, we have set up um, little booths at different like community events and as well as farmers markets. I had a picture in there of like us at a farmers market and it was a great recruitment tool. I think the best recruitment tool that I've discovered so far is I have just like a sandwich board that I set outside of the hospital that people can see as they pass by on a busy road. And I get a lot of interested volunteers through that. Excellent. Another question is, does your program have any focus on the LGBTQIA plus aging community? I would love to have more of a focus on the LGBTQ plus community. I identify as a queer person and we definitely have some clients and volunteers who are part of the community, but no, we don't have a specific focus on it. And then I have a, an additional question. I guess it's a little bit COVID based, if you will, or pandemic, pandemic in general. Have you found through this whole process, some unique um, interactions that you didn't have before that you're gonna keep moving forward with, that, that discovered a new way of interacting with people in a way that you'll want to um, continue or expand on after the after the pandemic is over? Um, not necessarily. I think that the pandemic brought attention to older adults in the community, to certain people that maybe had never really considered that population before, like when we had that huge spike in volunteers, like right at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of those people probably would have never sought out to participate in this program. So we were really fortunate. Um, and I believe that those volunteers are very attached to the people that they were matched to already. And I see them continuing to volunteer even after the pandemic is over. I also think moving the evidence-based health promotion program to a virtual platform was useful. We had people in a much wider geographic area that were able to participate. So I think moving forward, I'd like to return to some in-person health promotion classes, but still also offering occasional virtual opportunities as well. Great. We have two other questions that have come in. One, does Robert Wood Johnson Foundation provide any sort of training or guidance tools for organizations creating a VA program? Yeah, so that is the like the national caregiver 
National Volunteer Caregiver Network. I probably have those words mixed up, but yeah, so that that was born out of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and they offer all kinds of things. So they'll completely help you set up your program. They already have volunteer training that's like already ready to go for your people. Um, and then they also have bi-monthly meetings. So I can attend meetings with people from all over the country that are trying to do this work and we can like brainstorm and share ideas. Excellent. Another uh, comment question, have you heard of SAGE Metro, uh, Metro Portland? It's a group focused on the aging career community. Yes, and um, I'm very familiar with SAGE. We actually had them come out, this was years ago, but they came out and they, uh, they did a video presentation um, for us and like facilitated a community dialogue. I won't be able to remember the name of the movie at the moment, but it's about like LGBTQ people in long-term care. Excellent. And do we have any other questions? Okay. Maybe at the end of our questions then. Um, I do want everybody to know that Eric put earlier in uh, the, the chat and I just did again, the, the link to the survey um, for uh, that you need to fill out if you want the CEUs uh, for the program, but we also encourage you to fill it out even if you don't, because it's really helpful for us to understand what we could do uh, to continue these great uh, programs for you. Um, Britta, I would once again like to thank you for a fabulous session. Um, you shared some great information and, and the work that you're doing is sounds fabulous. And um, I hope it can be replicated in other communities that don't currently have it. And, uh, oh, there's one more that came in. Um, oh, a couple of them, let's see. Has Providence done any type of evaluation to show the worth and value of the program? There's not been any kind of like deep program evaluation. That would be really cool if we could do that, um, such if it was across all three sites, mine, Newburgh and Seaside. Um, I'm currently in the process of just doing a program survey for my volunteers and clients. It's not as like deep as a whole evaluation. Great, and then uh, one other that came in, is there a program like this in Lane County that you're aware of? Not to my knowledge. I have not heard of one in Lane County. I would try to contact maybe like the local AAA and see if they know of one, but I do not know of one. Great, any other? Any other questions? Well, again, thank you, Britta, for your time and, and all of your great work. It's very impressive. I wanna thank everybody for being here today. And um, there is, um, uh, remind everybody that the next uh, presentation will be Thursday, September 16th from two to three. And uh, it is going to be Lori Kramer with the OHSU Extension Services presenting on disaster preparedness for older adults and their caregivers. So with that, I just wanna thank everybody for being here today and thanks again, Britta, we greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Bye everybody. <laughs>